Hello, I am Steve Anderlees from the Vaughn Company. My co-presenter is Peter Brink from Underwriter Labs. Uh, the title of our talk is Debating Linux in Aerospace, Objections and Paths Forward. In this talk, we'll give a introduction, uh, then talk about some of the assurance concepts that are important in aerospace for assuring software, uh, and then look at a few of the standards. We'll talk briefly about the benefits of using open source, and then walk through in sort of a, a debate style a number of objections to the ability to use uh, Linux in uh, safety critical avionics. Hi, my name is Pete Brink. I am an automotive functional safety engineer working for Underwriter Laboratories. And um, when Steve proposed this idea of having a friendly debate, I was interested because I had actually started my career working on jet engine control systems. And I've been familiar with um, how uh, avionics software works, especially in a safety critical context. So um, it was important to me to have this discussion because I am active in the enabling Linux and safety applications community, uh, working with the open source engineering process team. My motivation for this talk is thinking through how we might use Linux in uh, higher assurance uh, safety critical software in aerospace, uh, but there are some challenges to doing so. So thinking through how we might address those challenges, uh, we thought would be a helpful presentation. Before we get into that back and forth of objections and possible answers, we want to go through a few of the concepts that are important in aerospace for safety critical software development and some of the standards that form the regulatory environment uh, that we must work under. Uh, first, uh, let's go through two terms. Reliable, reliability or reliable software means a system that does the right thing, that it's doing what you specified, it's acting according to the behavior that you require. A safe system uh, is the complement. It doesn't do the things you did not want. That is, there's no unexpected behaviors, no unanticipated uh, uh, actions that are, that are uh, coming out of the software. In aerospace, we have several, uh, the idea of, of diff several different levels or design assurance levels, software levels. Uh, from the most critical is level A. Uh, if something goes wrong with this software, fatalities could occur, and so this requires the most rigorous analysis demonstration uh, through evidence the software is correct. The least critical is level E. Uh, errors in this software don't result in any uh, disruption of the crew uh, and therefore doesn't require any formal evidence. Uh, level A software might be, for example, uh, software that forms the autopilot of the plane. Uh, level E might be example of software running the coffee maker or the entertainment system where it doesn't impact the uh, safety of the system. Although maybe not giving coffee to the pilot, you consider it an issue, but uh, generally, yes. Level A, most rigorous, and then down through B, C, D, all the way to E, the least rigorous. One of the key things that we look for when we are doing um, validation and verification of a safety critical system is specifically, uh, that we're following the appropriate processes that will minimize or eliminate the systematic error that we are that we have the opportunity to build into the system. So specifically, there are two terms that we look for here. The first of them is validation, which is basically the mechanism by which we demonstrate that we built what we set out to build, and verification. And verification is or are the set of processes that we go through to demonstrate that each of the different each of the different steps that we follow throughout the safety critical development life cycle are in fact being performed and are being performed in accordance with either the quality or the safety framework that we've established and we do all of those things specifically so that at the end we can demonstrate that the requirements that the the things that define what we set out to, that what we are going to set out to build are in fact in place and so we have a what's called a requirements traceability matrix where each phase of the development life cycle we have we start with the system requirements we do the software requirements based on those and in the context of the system requirements and then those software requirements we're expected to develop an architecture a design and 
code that reflect and demonstrate that those requirements have been fulfilled with the ultimate goal that we have a set of tests that demonstrate that the requirements can be complete. And of course, then the requirements themselves must have a, um, what's the best way to say it? They, they, they must have, the, their core requirements themselves must be testable specifically. Another part of making sure software is safe and reliable is checking that our tests have exercised the software. Uh, level D does require testing and testing against your requirements, but it doesn't require that we demonstrate coverage. All the other levels above that do. At level C, we have to show statement coverage. That is, our sets of tests must have executed every line of code. If there's any code there that was not exercised by the test, uh, some justification analysis is required for that. Uh, for example, you might have some defensive coding uh, that, that can't normally be tested, and then there would, that would be the justification for, for the test not covering it. At level B, we not only have to cover every statement, but we have to show that every branch has been taken for any decisions. And at level A, we have to show that every combination of those possible decisions at a branch have been exercised. Next, let's look at some of the standards in aerospace. Uh, there are a number of them that form the regulatory environment that we uh, must certify uh, software or a system under that has that software on it. Uh, on the US side, uh, the Federal uh, Aviation Administration, FAA, uh, has published an advisory circular which uh, uh, specifies the different means of compliance for showing how one can um, uh, assure software. Uh, that advisory circular points to probably the key document within aerospace uh, is DO 178C. Uh, in Europe, there's a, the parallel standard is ED 12C. Uh, so it's titled Software Considerations in Airborne Systems and Equipment Certification. Uh, this document is the standard that guides how we develop software for aerospace uh, for systems that will be flight certified. It was published about uh, 10 years ago, a little over a decade ago, and it has uh, four uh, 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 other documents that are appendices to it, uh, DO-330 through DO-333 that talk about uh, specific topics. Uh, for example, um, 330 talks about uh, tools that we use to develop software, such as a compiler or automated test framework, and whether those also need to be verified, or in this case, that we call them qualified. DO-297 uh, talks about how to approach modular uh, systems, uh, and so this is sometimes referred to as partitioning. And on the U.S. military side, Mill Handbook 516C is one of the documents that guide uh, how one would write software, particularly Chapter 15 of this uh, standard. Uh, and then on uh, the European side, uh, there's a uh, standard that just recently came out, uh, AMC 20-193, that uh, guides how we use multi-core processors. Uh, we expect a um, US version of this document to come out fairly soon uh, from the FAA. Uh, as of this recording, it had not yet been published. Uh, so on the US side, uh, we would uh, probably refer to the CAS 32A paper that talks about multi-core. There's also some system level documents from SAE, uh, ARP 4754A, and 4761, uh, which talk about uh, safety at a system level, but then also um, mention how this gets allocated hardware and software. Uh, and so this would flow down into software development under DO-178C. Uh, so with that background for assurance concepts and a quick overview of the different uh, standards that are applicable, why might we want to try to use an open source product like Linux for aerospace? Well, there are quite a few benefits. We'll just mention a few of them here. Uh, first, uh, in safety critical, critical domains, it's fairly important to have peer review, uh, expert review of the software to ensure it is suited to the purpose uh, and is safe, it's correct, it's assured. Uh, so using an open source licensed software like Linux gives us better visibility and so you get much broader review. Uh, a review by experts, review by regulatory authorities is, is easier because it's open source. Uh, another benefit is crowdsourcing. Uh, when new technology comes along, when better ways to approach something comes along, when a fix to a, 
existing problem comes along, those get filled in more quickly. You just have access to a broader uh, array of experts and perspectives that are contributing into the software, the, the crowdsourcing effect. And then lastly, uh, because Linux is so ubiquitous, it's a very well-known API. Uh, uh, use of Linux is, is across many, many different industries. Uh, it's really uh, one of the most commonly used OSs in the world. Uh, so that gives us a, a couple of bene benefits. Um, first, we um, uh, should be able to find uh, competent developers more easily because most students studying computer engineering or computer science will have used Linux already. They're familiar with it. Uh, and then it'll be easier for others to understand the code that we're developing if it's within the environment and uses Linux as an operating system. So we've heard from Steve about the specific advantages and opportunities that open source represents um, in terms of how we might use it in aerospace. We have in the safety community some specific objections, and those are listed here on the screen, that Linux doesn't have certification artifacts, it doesn't protect the code, it, uh, the design, the design of the kernel of Linux doesn't specifically permit safety, and the culture, the development culture around open source is not, we're, uh, it doesn't fit within the bounds of what we expect in a safety culture. So the first objection, and let me be very clear up front, um, the mechanism by which Linux de is developed and works, it, there, there is nothing inherently wrong with that. It's just that there are specific issues when we look at it from a safety and or a quality context um, in, terms of, um, in terms of why this objection is here. So specifically, the first of them is that Linux was not designed. Linux was grown organically. And there was a specific idea of what it was supposed to do and, and the, the job or role it was expected to fulfill. From a quality and a safety context, we're really looking to try and define that up front in, in order to, so that when we go through the development process, we can demonstrate that the architecture and the, and the design specifically are there to fulfill or match or fulfill those requirements that we set out in the first place. Um, there are that we lack a set of requirements and that's a key problem because when we talked previously about validation one of the key things that we're looking for is a mechanism whereby we can demonstrate that the demon that the that the product is is done that we want we want to have a set of tests that demonstrate that all of the requirements have been fulfilled it lacks a specific architecture which is another key piece and another key problem because what we're looking for here is a mechanism whereby we can perform a safety analysis against the architecture as presented. So in order for us to do that, we kind of have to have that architecture in place for us to do that analysis, analysis against. And the last of these is a unit design. So when we do the architecture, we're looking to demonstrate that we have a set of functional blocks and their interactions and then the unit design is specifically there to demonstrate how those individual blocks are designed and how they fulfill the interfaces that were specified in the architecture. Although Linux was not designed according to a single set of requirements and processes and according to rigorous standard to which every developer adhered, uh, it does have design and architecture. It's just more emergent, uh, really a crowdsource effect uh, that has produced over decades a fairly well-respected and, and well-designed uh, 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 system. Uh, however, uh, for safety critical domains, we need to demonstrate that that design is suited to the purpose that it's correct and safe. So how can we address some of these challenges? Um, the path forward probably involves reverse engineering the certification artifacts, that is the evidence from the source code, and also forward engineering from particular system requirements for a particular aircraft to show that Linux provides the functionality required and does so in a way that's safe and reliable. And so weaving these together in a way that shows that the system objectives have been satisfied, that the software is safe and, and reliable, uh, is, is a way to start pro providing that evidence that's required uh, in regulatory environments like aerospace. 
We might also look to find what an appropriate coding standard would be and then apply that to the code being used uh, from Linux for the aircraft uh, and uh, perhaps identify where there's some issues that the community would want to uh, improve and address problems. Uh, identifying the architecture and uh, perhaps um, encouraging the open source community, the Linux community, to start uh, coalescing around what that architecture looks like uh, and simply just documenting what's been emergent over the decades. And then finally, uh, looking at uh, different safety analysis to identify are there any potential flaws or, or areas where uh, uh, we want to make improvements to improve the safety of the system. The next objection is specifically that in terms of the mechanism of how Linux is developed, with a, that we don't, that Linux doesn't protect the code. What we look for in a traditional safety development lifecycle or, or in a quality development lifecycle is that there's a specific mechanism in place whereby we can go through and do an analysis on the code itself. Uh, not just the code, but the architecture and the requirements to determine the scope of, a, of what a particular change is going to do. And so as a consequence, um, we have this mechanism where, where the expectation, if there's an architecture in place, we can determine what the scope of the change is going to be and what the impact, and that's why it's specifically called an impact analysis on that architecture, that code, so that we can determine what the scope of the change actually is. Um, and and the you know the fact remains that uh, there are also specific competency requirements most of the time when we talk in a safety critical context. So the software engineers that work there are expected to be trained and knowledgeable on the safety standards and then follow the specific coding guidelines and design guidelines that define how we are expected to put the put the overall architecture or the system together. Uh, in this instance. Anyone can Linux, anyone can write a driver. So we're limited to, you know, whoever is out there and there essentially isn't any confidence or at least no demonstrated confidence that the driver as produced is going to comply with what all the safety standards might expect. Well, it is true that uh, anyone can propose an addition to the Linux uh, kernel. Uh, it is not true that anyone can just put their code in. There is a system of maintenance uh, that uh, checks the quality and sufficiency and, uh, of, of the code as it's uh, pulled in and examined, considered, and uh, eventually if it's uh, shown to be tested and appropriate, incorporated into the main line of Linux. Uh, for the aerospace industry, one way to uh, formalize this is to provide a curated and baseline profile that is uh, configure Linux for particular use, uh, including only the code that's necessary through configuration, uh, and then uh, maintain that in uh, the company's own configuration management system, for example, within a Git repo. Uh, that configuration would include uh, uh, the compile directory compiler directives uh, for how to build the system, the different configuration of which drivers are included or not, and since that now is a snapshot of the particular configured Linux on the aircraft, that can be maintained and managed or, or curated. Objection three is specifically around the design of Linux, the, the nature of what the Linux kernel actually looks like. And this actually goes back a little bit to the idea around that anybody can build a driver and anybody can make a modification to the kernel. So specifically, the kernel is monolithic, which means that the kernel and all the drivers all draw, all execute in the same, in the same privileged space. So on an Intel architecture, that would be ring zero. So specifically, what happens or what would happen to the kernel if a, if a driver misbehaved? So the driver misbehavior, we have a wild pointer and it can overwrite memory pretty much anywhere, not just in the kernel, but in, a, in some nominal application or function that's executing in user space as well, because the kernel has indeed access to all of memory uh, from a physical context. So 
um, if we look at the typical way that safety operating systems actually are organized, they usually have a kernel that is isolated unto itself, and it's the only thing that can execute in a privileged space. And in fact, all of the user space, all of the drivers are expected to execute in user space. And only then the kernel during initialization or other things can give, the, the kernel can then give access to drivers or applications um, in order for them to get access to system resources. And that can be anything from memory, it can be CPU time, it can be peripherals or other communication media. Uh, for in terms of how they're able to interact with either other applications or the outside world. Well, it is true that Linux is monolithic and that the kernel is relatively large. Much of the functionality is, is within the higher privileged uh, uh, high, uh, operating system uh, level, uh, it is not necessarily the case that every driver must be included in the kernel. There is the ability to put drivers in user space, and then the kernel provides a memory mapping so that the driver can get to those addresses related to the device it's managing and no, no others, providing some separation. Uh, the other path you can take forward is to not include code that's not necessary. Uh, generally, at higher DAL levels, we want less code that has to be proved, and so we leave out uh, through configuration the code that isn't needed for the particular function on an aircraft. Uh, and then for very high levels of assurance, one can also consider uh, partitioning, uh, for example, through a hypervisor where Linux is a guest operating system within one virtual machine or partition uh, and separating out functionality into different virtual machines. Understand this last objection is not a condemnation of how Linux works because it's clear that it does work and it's a strong mechanism for being able to produce an operating system that's used around the world. But we don't really have the, um, the confidence in it that we need to have when we're dealing with safety critical systems. And I'm talking about the software that operates a jet engine control system and keeps it flying or keeps it executing. The software that executes your brake controller on a, on a vehicle, that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of confidence that we want to have as part of that production. So when we look at these different items, Linux doesn't have a safety culture or a quality culture. Well, well both of those are actually based specifically around um, what, when, when I say software engineering, I mean something very specific. I mean that so, I mean it's the engineering of software. It's more like systems engineering than it is anything else because we follow a specific development lifecycle process. We follow requirements, architecture, design, implementation, and then testing at all the different levels. Now, it doesn't mean that it cannot be iterative, and it doesn't mean that you can't skip specific steps based upon the complexity or the difficulty of doing those things. But ultimately, what we wanna have at the end of this whole thing is a mechanism whereby we can prove everything is in the code that we expect to be there, and that there isn't anything else, and there isn't gonna be anything in there that doesn't work the way we expect it to. One way to handle the uh, variety of code contributions coming into Linux and thinking about that coming from a variety of different developers that aren't necessarily working to a single standard or a single uh, approach is to um, use um, a number of tools. First, uh, there are now available um, automated scanning tools that look for security vulnerabilities, uh, and this is something then that crowdsourcing can help us with to identify what are those vulnerabilities and what are the appropriate fixes to them. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the previous objection, uh, curation, that is managing a particular baseline, uh, can help to uh, uh, ensure that the version flying on the aircraft has been carefully uh, evaluated. And so that can be done by a team at an aerospace company that is working within a rigorous safety process. Uh, so that then is a particular distribution you can think of as, for example, produced by um, Yocto as a set of build recipes that have been checked and uh, managed to ensure that that is correct. Uh, building trust that the particular configuration on a particular aircraft is correct and safe. Uh, 
once that baseline is established, uh, one does not uh, is not forced to take a new driver or a new update of software. It can be evaluated and you can wait. You can see, does this prove out its correctness over time and only adopt those features uh, after they've been deemed safe. In conclusion, to support what Steve has said with regards to the possible paths forward, I agree completely and in fact, I am part of an organization within ELISA called the Open Source Engineering Process Group, where we're looking specifically at what we as an organization can do in order to include the engineering processes that are necessary in order for us to be able to make any safety or quality claims about the development of the code. And with apologies to uh, Lord of the Rings series, uh, one does not simply walk into airspace using Linux. Uh, that is, there are multiple challenges that have to be addressed. We've mentioned some of them here, not necessarily a complete list, but hopefully gives you a flavor for the sorts of things one might need to do to use Linux and Aerospace. Uh, if this is an interesting topic to you, uh, we'd like to encourage you to check out the ELISA Aerospace Working Group. Uh, this is a group of uh, industry, government, and academic professionals that are gathering uh, under the um, ELISA project to think about uh, how one could use Linux and Aerospace and tackle some of these challenges. I also encourage you to look for two papers in the upcoming IEEE Digital Avionics Systems Conference uh, that will be on use of Linux in aerospace uh, that comes up in October. Thank you for listening. We hope that you will uh, uh, contact we the authors with your questions and we'll try to respond to those in a timely manner.